It really is an honor to be back at Breaking Convention. I was not on the picture shown the other day, but I was already here in 2011 when all this started. So you see, I'm kind of a dinosaurian. My hair, though, is real. So I'm aware that in the following talk, I will only cover a very small aspect of the big term setting. Uh, I will leave out a lot, so please, uh, be merciful with me, and it is a warning for all the things you will miss. Thank you in advance. You all know this picture. Client lying on a sofa, upper body slightly raised, blindfolds, headphones. To his right and left, you see a female and a male therapist who are there and supposed to hold his hand in case he needs help. And this type of setting is presented in an efficient and unquestioning manner. I learned these three sentences, which mark the setting, when I became a, a psychedelic practitioner last year myself, after all these years. And uh, these, as I said, mark the setting. Are we really sure that this setting is the only, the best for the client, the most effective and the most sustainable for the processes? I don't know. But are we allowed to discuss it, or is it a holy cow? I don't claim to declare anything from the normal setting, the so-called normal setting, to be wrong or inefficient or whatever. Uh, I only ask quest these questions because I think questions trigger inner search processes, and because I assume that we are all seekers to find the even better for our clients. Today, I will present five settings that I have experienced myself. And to say it beforehand, they were all, except for the ayahuasca, in the low dose mode. And the guides or teachers always took the medicine as well as I did. So this beforehand, so that I don't have to name it every time. So after uh, the five settings, I will uh, uh, list different criteria that I retrospectively ex uh, experienced as supportive. I will explain my own developed setting. Uh, then I, what my clients and I achieved and learned on the way and where this led to and the tools I used. I will not talk about all the mistakes and all the pitfalls and all the, that will be another lesson or lecture next year maybe. Uh, I will talk about my own being left alone and shortly reflect upon the inner healer. And I will list when I think it's right to leave the client alone and when I think uh, we should uh, support the client or when we really have to. And I will then introduce a term, a, a substance competence. And at the end, I will present a very short summary. So. Friday evenings, uh, you'll see the external criteria. There were lessons on substances, dose, set, and setting. And believe it or not, set and setting was a very new term at these times. We heard about music. We knew a very, very few contraindications. And believe it or not, indications were known yet. So, and we learned what we should do on the session. Uh, the substance sessions lasted all Saturday, and we sat in circles, uh, in a circle on chairs. And during the S sense, the teacher would say, "Be with what is, or what's your inner process." And um, uh, then, uh, uh, on the plateau, he would make remarks in between, mostly about love or about virtues or something like that. There was silence uh, all the time, and we should move as little as possible. Breaks and going to the bathroom were allowed every few hours. And in the decent phase, uh, so-called non-resistance music was played. Uh, this uh, non-resistance music, this is two hours of music uh, all over the place, all styles, all 
tempos, uh, modes, and whatever, and you were supposed not to react upon it. So, and the sharing took place the next day, this was on Sunday, but only for those who wanted. And then everyone had to send a minute, a minute uh, after, within 14 days after the session to every other participant and uh, the uh, leading uh, team. And um, so we had to do this by real mail because there was no email at that time. So uh, at least what was not, not helpful to me was really being left alone all the time without a reference uh, person, without support in difficult moments. No exchange, sitting the whole time was quite a challenge for eight hours. And the large group, the short sharing, no integration time and the not inclusion of the body. After the setting, uh, the training had ended, uh, I was lucky to find a group close to Zurich. And then there was silent meditation in the morning and uh, as well psychological and philosophical teachings. The session started in the afternoon and lasted into the night. In the ascent and partly on the plateau, they were the same teachings as in the morning. And sometimes we did very small exercises like finding your reference point or the jumping from a high tower uh, into the nothing so that you could learn how to, to let go of whatever thing. And um, during the session, music was played interspersed as well as in the training, by the way. And um, in the decent phase, we listened to uh, non-resistance music uh, as well. And the next morning, we shared in small self-chosen groups. And here I found the same non-supportive criteria. Now here, uh, I had the enormous privilege to do this training with the late Ralph Metzner. Uh, the preparations were very intense. Ralph would announce the topic beforehand so that one could prepare, for example, the medicine wheel. And in the mornings, we had teachings uh, about the medicine wheel and uh, the different sections were explained and taught. And we placed our individual lives into the sections. And on a personal level, the phases of life were discussed in small groups and creatively enriched through drumming, painting, writing, discussing, and so on. The session started in the afternoon uh, in a room with chairs and a self-prepared altar uh, in the middle. And then Ralph did the invocation of the spiritual allies and the spiritual guides and he did uh, the light fire meditation. And this then um, uh, was followed by each of us going to the altar and placing a, an, a special item on this altar, naming then the, the intention for oneself and the intention for the group. And when we had all done this, then we took the medicine and meditated for about 10 minutes more. Please go. It does. We then moved silently and ritually into the inner chamber. It was exactly like that. And while the substance flooded in, Ralph reminded us to breathe and to center ourselves. It was not allowed to speak or to move. Ralph then led through the content of the morning teaching during the session and guided the basic ideas. And the alchemical divination comprised four phases, the intention question, the memory of the target event, the comprehensive perception, and the actual memory, which meant then you had the insights and the peace uh, within you, and you looked at the same uh, target memory uh, differently, which then led to integration. And these actual phases were separated from each other. I hope it worked. By small, no, it doesn't. By small breaks and exercises like uh, tones, music, and yoga asanas. And when the descending effect was almost ended, we then moved back into the inner room and we ritually took our items back from the altar, uh, naming, reminding us and the group of the intentions we gave, reporting in one sentence the gift we got and giving thanks. And then Ralph declared the session to be over. And the next morning there was a sharing 
uh, in a round with a talking stick. And I tell you, this was so impressive. I have nothing to remark. It was the best ever in my life. There I learned practically everything. Here, my intention was uh, to learn about a single setting and the substance ketamine. Uh, I knew the therapist, he sat behind me. Uh, I've, the only awkward thing was that I felt somehow on display, but to be very honest, uh, the dose was so um, uh, that I don't recall a darn moment, nothing <laughs> black. Uh, I felt like cartoon afterwards, ha ha having gotten wet. And um, so, uh, oh, I thought I was going to die. My last thought, my only thought. So here, my husband and I flew to Brazil uh, to a Western style retreat uh, once or sometimes even twice a year. And in the mornings, uh, present scientists uh, gave lectures uh, about their latest research, which we then could discuss, or there was a sharing from the last night's session. And in the afternoon, we had guided tour uh, excursions to see entheogenic plants. I hope I pronounced it right. Or we did an excursion to the sea. Uh, the sessions were held overnight, and the initial ritual included tying a knot in a rope, the ends of which then were tied together to symbolize cohesion of the group. Uh, then everyone determined his amount uh, of brew uh, he or she wanted to drink, and we took the brew ritually all together with a prayer. After everyone took his place, the guide sang his Icaros. Uh, one was asked not to speak and not to interfere with each other. So when one needed help, one could fetch the guide. He then would come uh, and lay hands on or chant or do some little ritual. Uh, the music played without interruption, no, with a few interruptions all the time. And when you were done, you went downstairs, had a bite to eat, or you went to sleep or talked to the others, whatever you liked to do. So what did I experience as to be supportive? You can read it. Uh, I did this retrospectively, not while I was on or while I was in any uh, um, retreat. I really reflected afterwards upon it. So how did my own setting evolve? Well. Uh, I, I naturally uh, give only the good results. As I said before, I will talk about the process and all the mistakes I did in another lecture. There you will be very astonished. So, uh, in my own group, first uh, we, six people, later more, uh, I started in the mode of the training setting, but lying down naturally, also in absolute silence. And during Ascent, I intermittently reminded people to let go, to relax, and really to allow the substance to flood in. Uh, some clients naturally began calling me to their mat because they had some irritation or difficult feelings. Or, you know, I can't name them all. And so I would walk over, sit next to them, and regularly the neighbor felt disturbed or even interfered. So at one time, when Quite a lot called me, and all at the same time, I had the brilliant idea, and I said, why don't we all sit up? And uh, so then I would, uh, everyone shared where he was, and somehow I started working, uh, uh, like asking how you feel, and uh, what else do you see, and so on. And so this work started actually by chance, then the others uh, and some, when I worked like on an issue with a father or a mother, they would join the same process and process the same thing themselves. So many clients said, I want to work now. I want to work. So we actually started working. And um, to have, a, a, I give you an example, to have kind of a real experience, I, uh, we introduced the modified constellation. That means we put two uh, people in juxtaposition and constellated it, and one was the mother and the other was uh, the one who, who worked. Uh, so this was then be became an interaction, and uh, we solved relationship issues and work uh, issues and all this sort of thing with constellation work. 
the body work developed by itself when body science showed up uh, spontaneously or when I would invite the client to really feel deep down into his body. And since I am a, a trained holotropic breath worker, I somehow knew how to deal with this and uh, we got over the things and I got smarter. The clients were involved uh, so in uh, supporting each other in this modified constellation and I engaged them in helping uh, to determine uh, the substance we took on Saturday and I engaged them in uh, fine-tuning their dose. I asked them what did you take last time, how much would you have this time and so on in very fine uh, steps. Uh, and they supported each other when necessary. And after a sequence of work, whatever you call it, uh, I would play an appropriate piece of music and we would all lie down again to back, go back into stillness. But uh, to tell you, uh, after the music had stopped, someone would pop up and say, I want to work. So uh, the sessions changed by itself. Uh, I didn't change it because I wanted to do better. It changed by the feedback of the clients and the progression of the processes. So now, the sunny side of the work, sure. <laughs> what did the clients achieve? Well, after some time, they achieved exactly what I think is important. They were, you may read it. And when I looked at it, it actually turned out like Ralph's guidance in a way. So after some time, especially with MDMA and a very low dose uh, things, they could navigate the inner processes by themselves. And sure, we learn. As I uh, said, I don't name all the pitfalls here. And this, in the end, led to safety and trust in the substance, in the process, oops, I have within themselves and their process, and in me, not as their therapist, but as their companion. And I would say, at least what I could overlook until 209, these sustainable results uh, I uh, uh, took the conclusion that they uh, are completed because we did work during the session and we intermittently shared, which means a mental process from the inner process out. And we did first integration steps. And these I always, even from the beginning, without knowing all this, what I know nowadays, uh, I always embodied them. And the main sentence was, Teach your body how it feels when you are, and then you, you, you know. Now, here shortly are my tools. Those who have read my book know it. The Modified Constellation Work for Relationship. So now what happens if I leave the client really completely to his own inner process? Let me talk a little bit about myself. When I started with the training, um, I was 47 years old. I was completely drug naive and we were on low dose. So we started out with, let's say, 50 to 75 micrograms LSD. But I tell you, I was completely overwhelmed by images. I was in a pantry in a concentration camp in fire, and I couldn't assign anything to the context. Some I got later, like 15 years later in an ayahuasca session, I understood. I was completely overwhelmed by emotions, from bliss to rage to horror to bliss to whatever. And I, I didn't know how to stir myself. I was overwhelmed by the flood of thoughts, let alone remember them. And uh, I regressed, I fell into despair, I had physical ailments. I relived traumatic experiences that I had uh, not in my real mind. I uh, went through the near-death experience of my birth and I fell into dissociative states. So, And I, I hated myself and I could not find ways out because I didn't know what really to do. 
And, uh, and it didn't even occur to me to get help. First, it was men. And secondly, uh, I'm a post-war uh, product. And um, uh, doing things alone is in my deepest nature. So I had to learn to fetch for help. And uh, in the end, really nothing work, was worked through. And the word integration uh, is, was not so much in use at that time. To say it really not at all. Now, let me uh, make a few remarks on the inner healer. I agree, and I know that there is a deeply rooted knowledge within us, especially in the body, that knows about being whole and healed. We don't have it always accessible. And yes, there are life changing experiences, but these are not the rule. And non mystical experience often fade away if they are not really rehearsed and taken into, uh, and they turn into an issue of knowledge or an interesting narrative. For me, the inner healer is a wise entity within us, awakened through an interplay between the substance and the individual. And if we follow this instance, it stirs within us and helps us behave in a way to change towards our own responsibility and our own responsible actions. And then I think that our patterns of um, thinking, feeling, and acting are so optimized uh, and cannot be changed by thinking, wishing, imaging, or in my perspective, please correct me if you have another uh, idea, Besides intention and will, it badly needs an embodiment as a felt sense to start. So I think it is about, in the end, about embodying the corrective new experiences in order to be maintained in everyday life. And as we all know, learning is always related to some other person. It's a relational thing, learning. So, when can I leave the client alone to his inner process? Sure, they are, they are, you can leave him alone, especially if he wants to. And if you had first a consent about it, leave me alone. And still, I have to check him and hold the space, which I really think is important, and ask him how he is once in a while. And if he is really fine, leave him alone. And if he is not really fine, I can offer him something. And if he consents, I can, whatever he needs. When should I accompany or support the client? Naturally, if he wants to. And when it is obvious that he needs it. Sure, there always must be consent. This is obligatory. But I at least can tell, shall I hold your hand? Or do you want to uh, need a shoulder to lean on? Or what do you need? So, and... When can I not leave? Always my opinion, okay? When can I not leave the client to his process? There are several topics here. The first are attachment and relationship issues. For me, they can only heal in relationship. People with attachment, bonding, binding, deficiencies or disorders have not experienced what it feels like uh, to be secure and safe. And how can you learn it? Only by experiencing it. How it would feel to be liked and held, relaxed, safely with the body, like you would hold a baby. When the baby is really relaxed, then it uh, knows I'm safe. And within a lived example, we know that. So, and trauma of any kind. Uh, we, we all know that trauma all have an impact on uh, the relationship, not only with others, but with ourselves. And there are traumas like trauma by omission, traumatizing experiences through neglect, disregard, psychological violence. These are accompanied by guilt, shame, fear, states of inferiority, um, self-criticism, depression, and psychosomatic complaints. Recognition and understanding must first come from the outside. They need to hear that they are lovable because they are there, that they are worthy because they are there, 
uh, uh, that this he or she is not to blame for what has happened for him. And for this, he needs a real present person who meets him in true contact, including the body, including the body. I'm sorry. I know there are limits and red lines and yeah. Uh, and at least the eye, the eye, the eye and the voice. And relationship here is the only path to healing. There's trauma by commission. We know, you know this too. Traumatizing experiences through physical violence, sexual abuse, accidents, war. Here, the same applies as to trauma by omission, but in this case, and we don't know beforehand, so uh, here's specific knowledge in trauma science, especially those of, from the body that show up in psychedelic sessions uh, and in trauma therapy is needed so that the client can be safely guided through the uh, psychological and uh, physical events. The pent-up bodily uh, symptoms should be uh, discharged so, event so eventually uh, the event can be classified as over. And this also includes birth processes. So, uh, and I personally think that these three issues cannot be worked on in the inner process alone. It will show up by itself, by the way. Before I move slowly towards, towards the summary, I will share two thoughts of you. They with you. They they are different. So I start with one. Um, I I believe that we should take advantage of the often quoted window of opportunity, and the well-known property of increased neuroplasticity associated with psychedelics. Why not on the session? when the window is wide open and when the learning capacity is very increased. The next day, I speak out of experiences, uh, the insights have lost their liveliness, the emotions are less powerful. In some people, they are already memories, so they, they don't have access. So why don't we use this? So, and for me, for me this means really therapeutic working with what the client is experiencing or better what he has just experienced to take out a little piece that really can be worked through and then it's over. This was the first thought. The second, um, I, I try it out and um, I, I hope that some of you will take this up and make something out of it or together with me, I don't know. So, um, I believe that so many uh, people are uh, doing psychedelics, are in therapy, and uh, do training to be a practitioner. And uh, I believe that uh, all psychedelic intaker <laughs> should be empowered to learn skills related to substances, to benefit more from the sessions. I, and I would like to introduce this term as substance competence. You know, when we become a therapy, when you become a therapist, you, you have a line what your competencies uh, have to be. So we, and you know the, the order. We all have to have knowledge. Knowledge, I mean, really all about substances, about not only the, the dosages, the, the if, if efficacy, the effects, the side effects, the dangers, the benefits, and so on. You can, one can complete it. And they naturally should have knowledge in how to be on a substance or in an altered state of being, which uh, re reminds me of holotropic breathwork. Everybody should have that beforehand. And they need skills. So, and we can teach these or live them. So we, we can do meditation or we can invite to do meditation. We can do holotropic breathwork. We can do awareness training so that they know how to self-explore, how to self-inquire themselves, uh, like self-guidance, self-observation, and so how to ask to deepen their process and to keep on the line they want to go. And sure, they need experience. Experience is, on one hand, grows with the number of sessions. So you all know this. The more experiences you do, the better you know, and then you go, this I won't do anymore, and so on. But they need experience in other uh, areas as well. Here I wanted to write safety, trust, and security, but it came out trust in the substance. Mm -hmm. I, I said uh, already, we need 
trust, safety, and security. They should experience this, that they know it. They should experience true relationship. And they should experience connection. And I mean connection with the divine, connection with their spouse, with their fellow neighbor, with nature, with whatever there is. And really embody it and know that they are connected even when they are not on a psychedelic session. And this brings me then to the substance competent psychedelic therapist. And this is a must. Sorry, it's a must. And uh, I mean therapists who have really worked through their own issues, know their sunny sides, their shady sides, their abysses, and can truly relate and have lots and lots and lots of psychedelic experiences where they work this through. And in addition to being trained as a psychedelic practitioner, they should at least have one therapeutic method, at least one, if not three or four, not in depth, but know about it, other possibilities, you know. They should be trauma-informed, really trauma-informed, and be skilled in body therapy. I know that I have left out all a lot. You know it, you. But I thank you for your being uh, merciful with me. Wait, wait, wait. I'm not done yet. Okay. I, I want you. Uh, so I came to the following conclusion very quick. The client needs substance competence, he needs relationship, he needs integration opportunities, and he needs substance competent therapists. And if my thoughts have done something within you and triggered an inner search process, I will be so thankful.